hi, I'm Dave. I'm the front-end manager at Adestria. We're one of the co-sponsors, and I'm very happy to be here. We're very proud to sponsor it. Uh, this talk was actually Marcus's idea. Uh, he suggested that it might be something people like to hear about. Otherwise, I wouldn't have anything to talk about, so I'm very grateful for coming up with the ideas. I'm going to introduce, for those that aren't already plunging into it, the best bits of the latest bits of JavaScript. Um, that is pronounced 20xdx, in case you're wondering. That is not official name, it's just what I call it. But first, a better first slide. There we go. <laughs> Bit more futuristic. Whoa! Yeah. Now that's really 20xdx. Right, so um, what is new? Lots. Uh, I can't cover it all. Ten minutes is just nowhere near enough. Um, so I'm just going to skip this and go straight on. What's it all about, though? Uh, basically, it's about developers. It's about you lot. Um, TC39, the people, the governing body behind the language, and uh, they've decided that it's better to shortcut some of those patterns that we do most commonly, making tasks less repetitive, reducing boilerplate, increasing DX, developer experience, uh, ultimately about writing less code, which is hopefully about making less bugs as well. But, yeah. <laughs> IE11 is still hugely popular, and so is IE10 and 9. IE11 is even still shot with, shipped with Microsoft's business packages as a serious contender to Edge, which is just baffling. Um, and it supports none of what we're about to cover. Uh, so Babel is a heavy lifter to do with converting all of your 20xdx code into ES5 which is what IE9 can understand. There are alternatives to Babel, and there are alternatives to Webpack, but they are by far the industry leaders. Webpack is not essential because Babel's own uh, examples show Babel being invoked directly on a command line with a Babel command, but that's just not really realistic. And everyone is sort of familiar with bundlers of some sort by now, whether it's Gulp or Grunt or indeed Webpack. And Webpack really helps. It is complicated. I, I can't skirt around that. It is complicated. The config looks like a complete head fuck. Um, but it does get easier, and I really do recommend these starter kits. The top ones is Webpack's own list of starter kits, and the second one here is one which I've personally vetted because it is basically a vanilla JavaScript 20xdx starter kit. It doesn't add React, which obviously just muddies the waters further. All these best bits I'm about to talk to you about are good to go with a bit of Babel and Webpack. Um, there are even some parts in here which aren't even completely agreed with TC39, all the people that actually agree the standard, but realistically, it's not the syntax which is going to change, it's going to be the implementation under the hood. So you're still good to go, it shouldn't change. So let's start. Template literals. Great way to create interpolated strings, such as this. So this is your typical bit of JavaScript, complete with a typical error. <laughs> I've got a single quote here in a single quote delimited string. And this is just one of the examples, typical pains of ES5 string concatenation. The new version, however, I don't know whether you use those at the back can see it, is delimited with backticks. And inside backticks, I can use as many kinds of quotes as I want. And it just works perfectly. And this here, the dollar curlies, is how you do some string interpolation. And inside those curlies, you can have any kind of JavaScript um, expression. Very powerful. But this is just the start. The best bit is that they're multi-line. So I can stick in loads of HTML here. Imagine this is way more than just one single button. If you're doing this with, 20, uh, with ES5, there'll be backslashes at the end of lines. There'll be pluses all over the place. It'll just be a nightmare. So lovely. Next up. Destruction, rest, and spread. So this came with ES2015 and then was built on in ES2018. Um, these are really ridiculously powerful to use. And if none of the other examples in my slides make you feel like some sort of JavaScript Jedi, using this definitely will. So let's do some diving in. So you're consuming some API of uh, Star Wars characters, because obviously that's what we all do, right? <laughs> uh, we've got Luke here. And uh, we want to... <coughs> work with Luke's properties as tersely as possible, say the mother property here. Normally we'd have to drag it out, reassign each of these things, because we don't want Luke.mother everywhere in our code, right? That's for both. We'd have to reassign it. And every time we reassign it, there's two places we can make a typo. Imagine this isn't just two properties, imagine this is 10 or 20. The new version here is using destructuring syntax. So this creates two variables, first name, last name, names deliberately after the property names of Luke.mother. So this here 
curlies on the left side of the equals is destructuring syntax. Other than that, it's just getting them from a variable. And as you continue to work with this data, you are likely to want to update it. So, say in some other version of the uh, Star Wars trilogy, Luke gets killed and we have to update our database. If we were doing this the old way, we would probably create some new objects, because of course we're using immutable data types like the good people we are, and we would assign to it a new object literal, bits of loop, and then override the thing that has changed here or the live is false. It's just, it's just boilerplate, it's just too much. This is the new way. So here we can create a new object literal, in this case the curlies are on the right hand side of the equals, and this little buddy here the spread, the rest spread operator, we can spread the contents of Luke, that's all of that, into a new variable, and of course it comes with a live, and then we can override a live to false as a last, as a last step. Lovely. And removing a property gets even more funky, right? This is what we call destructuring assignment syntax. So I've got this on multiple lines here, but it's the same as before. We've got curlies to the left of the equals, so we are destructuring Luke. We have taken a live. There's a live. We've taken force affiliation. There's force affiliation. And then for the rest of the properties of Luke, we are spreading them into a new variable called new Luke. And due to the way that the structuring syntax works, new Luke will only contain first name and last name, because force affiliation and alive have been destructured off of Luke. This is a really powerful way. It's confusing, but it gets very easy very quickly, believe me. And compared to the amount of code that you'll be doing to do this all over the place, this delete thing, God, I hate that. Uh, this is a nicer way of doing it for sure, even if it is a little confusing at first. That was fun. Next up, async await. So in ES2015, we got promises. If you're a bit unfamiliar with those, I'll read the description. They are a first-class representation of a value that may be made asynchronously available in the future. They're just a lovely way of doing callbacks. There'll be a brief example of that in a second. Async await makes promises nicer by making them more declarative. So this is callback hell, or the pyramid of doom. Here, in my example here, this is the firing sequence for a Death Star. So there's the guy that gives the command, he goes, then there's that person that goes, <laughs> and then there's that lev that goes, boo, everyone knows the one, right? And then having murdered billions of people, you go home to your wife and kids. And we can make this simpler, and no one really likes this pyramid of doom because it's hard to reason, it's hard to pick apart, it's hard to debug, and ultimately this is really contrived. This is just like one function. If this were loads, your code just gets unreadable. So we've changed it here to promises. So in each of these cases, we have a then statement. And this is what I refer to as the a dude wears my car of thens. There are too many thens then. And it's, it's getting a bit repetitive. And more to the point, this is the only place you'll see this kind of code in JavaScript. It's just a bit out of place. And this was actually cited as one of TC39's reasons for <coughs> providing async await. This doesn't look like anything else you'll ever encounter. So let's async it. So in this case, this is exactly the same as before, and at each of these cases, when an async is encountered, it pauses the function. So we have to flag the function as being asynchronous, and that basically tells the rest of your JavaScript to expect a promise in return. So it runs the give command, it awaits the response, it then moves on to clicking around the buttons, awaits that response, pulling the lever, etc., etc., etc. And we go home to the wife and the kids. And lastly, ES modules. Now, these are by far the quickest win um, of any of the new features, in my opinion. If, if you are new to any of this and you want to start with something, start with ES modules. They're particularly good in large applications. Um, it's the code base scaling feature that JavaScript has been most needing, in my opinion. It's just a lovely way to work with files. So previously, you'd have done something like this. You'd have got some JavaScript, a bunch of HTML files. You'd have put these in in a very specific order because, of course, it's quite a brittle load order. You might have tried to avoid it with gulp or grunt, something along those lines. But either way, it was always very easy to lose sight of what was actually depending on what. Like component 4, if, if this were in a, a bunch of gulp files, what is using component 4? 
did I, did I actually take out component four last week? I can't remember. Your description of the dependencies, basically, is separate to your code. There's a lot of namespacing as well, a lot of boilerplate involved. Like, you're a good developer, right? So you want to prevent scope pollution of the window object. You probably want to use strict. And now we can do this. We can import what we want, only when we use it, and call it immediately. Everything is strict by default, everything is private by default, lovely separation of concerns, and then you get dynamic imports as well. A great way to split your code so that it only loads when you need it. And that's the end of that. Some references quickly. Thank you, I'm done. <laughs>